I think if uh, if we uh, it's okay. You you hear me? Huh? Okay. All right. So uh, thank you. Uh, I thank those that uh, managed to wake up and come. I mean, if this uh, trend is uh, continues, I think in two hours we will be only the speaker alone. <laughs> so you should uh, get ready for that. <laughs> um, so what I try to do today, um, I'll give you some very basic um, consideration, let's call it. Um, consideration of three-dimensional electron microscopy. I mean, to, un to explain really electron microscopy and 3D electron microscopy, uh, I would need much many more hours and we are doing it over a, a full semester. But what I'll do, I'll give you some uh, uh, hints and show you some of the consideration, as I said, and then also show you some example. I will mainly deal with how can we reconstruct and how can we get structure in situ. And the reason is that, uh, you know, structural biology and uh, if you are interested in biology, I think in the end of the day, we really want to get structure of our protein of interest inside the cell. Um, and there are, of course, uh, in vitro is very fundamental and we would not manage to achieve any, anything without it. Other techniques like crystallography and NMR are very fundamental and in fact we would not be able to recognize and to identify any structure uh, inside the cell if we would not have their structural fingerprint. So this is by not mean by any means, this is not a, com a competitional uh, method, but rather complement. And also, I think that if we consider the overall field of 3D uh, uh, electron microscopy, the principle, basi the principle uh, uh, the basic principle that guide here are the very same for every electron microscopy. Actually, I think they are even more general. So single particle electron microscopy that nowadays is very fashionable because of the fantastic resolution that you can uh, get. And uh, we are ourselves also start to do single particle electron microscopy because it's relevant and important. But um, it's a specific case for uh, uh, the electron tomography that we use. Okay, so electron tomography is the most general way of uh, of uh, uh, of getting three dimensional information, but one word about this person that happened to uh, invent the electron microscope in the uh, end of the twenties uh, in Germany, and uh, the reason why he uh, managed to do that was because he knew how to build lenses, and that was right after uh, a few years before it was shown that electrons uh, actually can diffract and that was uh, the reason why one can believe that uh, that uh, one can build an electron microscope this is the first electron microscope um, and uh, it can be seen in the deutsche museum in munich uh, the exact microscope and there, near this microscope, you will see a list of the component that uh, Ruskow was using in order to build the microscope. And if you sum up the cost of all the components together, it ends up with 142 Deutsche Mark. Now, it doesn't matter. The Deutsche Mark means that it's, uh, let's say, 70 euros. And it doesn't matter uh, how much uh, uh, you will add because uh, of uh, 80 years, you will never reach the few millions that uh, we should pay in order to get the new generation of microscopy. One, another important point, electron microscopes were developed not because uh, the great eagle for biology. It was a pure invention for material science. With the years, of course, 
other people took it to uh, biology. But the first and primary reason why to build such a machine is because light microscopy can give you only, on, only especially these days, a very limited magnification. Electron has a wavelength in vacuum, let's say in 100 kilovolt or so, tw uh, 200 kilovolt, uh, they have a, a wavelength of 2, 3, 4 pico meter. So in theory, we should be able to see even an atom. One atom, and there is uh, those that use a microscope in the old days. Well, and your brother was uh, one of the pioneers here. I know. Um, there were, there were uh, in this microscope, in the old microscope, there was a bottom which called Scherzer Focus. Scherzer was a, a German theoretician, and uh, in one of his theories is uh, to find the right focus to see an atom. This, of course, absolutely not relevant to biology, because in biology we have samples that are very sensitive to a uh, to electron dose. But in general, in, in, in theory, we should be able to see fraction of an atom. So that was the primary reason why to use, uh, uh <coughs> to use microscope, electron microscope. Now, so this, the, our microscope nowadays looks very similar in terms of the organization uh, of the microscope, the electron source, lenses, our sample, and then uh, a kind of a camera. But the difference is, of course, they are much more uh, safe. Most of what you see here, for example, on the column is actually the protection. But, uh, and it's mainly a uh, and that's very important for us, especially if we want to do cryomicroscopy and look into cell. Everything is computer controlled. And that, of course, means that we can reduce dramatically the dosage. Okay. So, electron tomography is the most uh, general way to get a three-dimensional structure. It works, by the way, exactly like CT like computer tomography, but here we are dealing with electron and not with X-ray. And therefore, um, we, can, uh, we, we, can, we can be more accurate as we, uh, we electrons, of course, follow a magnetic field, so we can spread and, and concentrate the beam. We, we have very good, maybe not good enough, but quite good lenses nowadays. And that's very important if we wish to get very high resolution. So it works as follows. We have a, even, let's say, a polyomorphic structure. And we collect projection of the structure as seen from different directions. Then we can use these proje this projection uh, images, the 2D images, in order to calculate the 3D structure using what we call the weighted back projector algorithm. I will deal with it in a second. Now, the quality of this, of this uh, uh, reconstruction is directly depend on the number of the views that we will use. And maybe here in the Hebrew University, the best example is to take this image. So what we do here is we calculate the projection and then reconstruct the structure. And when the we add more and more uh, projection. You see that the uh, that uh, the structure become better and better until you can already recognize uh, Albert here. And when the rec resolution even increase more, you see much much more uh, details. Uh, I mean, I'm saying that it's the proper example here because, as most of you know, or some of you know, the Hebrew University owns the right of using Albert. So if after this talk you go out and you suddenly see him, based on this reconstruction, you would really identify. Okay? So that's a, a, a very uh, important issue. Now, here is a more, uh, let's say, realistic example, <coughs> by the way, because, you know, we are very good in identifying faces. 
we are less good in identifying polyomorphic structure as proteins, for example. You know, if we look on a protein uh, reconstruction, unless it's in extremely very high resolution, it's very hard for us to identify which, which, uh, uh, which protein it is. As most, of prote most proteins and even protein complexes, we look more or less like potatoes. Okay, so uh, we really <coughs> we really need to have very high resolution, which means we need to have many, many projection images. Now, if we have an object, and here you start to see the artifact of not sampling well the space. So here you can have an object, and we, have, we are uh, reconstructing the object based on one projection. Of course, this is a two-dimensional object, which means that projection is a one-dimensional. It's a line. Okay, and if we have one line, we only see, uh, to in from this direction, we only see three lines. And now if we start to have uh, more and more projection, you will see uh, that we start to see this round object. Although, even if we have quite a bit for such an object, you see the artifact of not sampling well the, uh, the field, the space. Why can we do back projection? We can do back projection because of uh, what we call the projection theorem that uh, uh, actually uh, meaning that uh, the outcome of this, uh, the conclusion is that we can, uh, the, that the 2D Fourier transfer of an object image is identical to the central section plane through its 3D uh, Fourier transformation. So in 3D space, you will, you will understand it in a second. So here we have a Mona Lisa. Okay, and now if we if we uh, tilt Mona Lisa, or we if we uh, calculate a projection from a bit tilted region, uh, that means that uh, the projection, which is a line, can be put, ba put back in the Fourier space in a tilted manner, of course, the difference between, or the angle between the projection and the, uh, in this case, the line in the Fourier uh, transformation, the Fourier space, is uh, 90 degrees, as this is a reciprocal space. Now, and you can see that, uh, how it actually works. So, we, uh, each time, we we'll collect a projection, and we put it here, and we will uh, eventually fill the, uh, the reciprocal space and get a final resolution, uh, the, the final image. Now, if we do that, we have a geometrical problem. So, actually two. If we consider, if we do it in electron tomography, what happens is that we fill the, uh, the, the, the space, where we end up with empty region here and empty region there. They are empty and we cannot fill this because when we tilt our sample, we cannot tilt it to 90 degrees. Okay, so this is a pure geometrical consideration. <coughs> but you can see another, another problem here. So the here is the low resolution. The low resolution regime is sample much more than the high resolution regime. Okay? You can see the gaps here are huge, the gaps here are very small, okay? And this, we cannot do much, but simply weighting the function that we, um, weighting uh, the information here. So this information is less pronounced, uh, the, uh, and then the quality would be somehow similar, but still we'll have more gaps in the very high resolution region. Now, this, what I said, is, uh, has to do with uh, electron tomography, but in fact, it has to do also with single particle EM. Because in single particle EM, the only difference is that we do not take one sample and tilt it, but we are gaining the different tilts by taking different identical, identical uh, complexes orient on the grid at a different, di different orientation, 
Okay, so that's the actually the same problem and the same idea. In tomography, we don't have the problem how to find the exact orientation of this uh, complex, but uh, because it's the always the same uh, uh, complex, and uh, I'll get to that actually in the very last slide on the uh, on uh, a very last slide on in this talk because I think that some very interesting application I recently show, and maybe that's an excellent future for electron microscopy. So. <coughs> How do we do cryo? Now we understand more or less how uh, can we see 3D, at least in theory. Now, in order to look on cell and in order to look on, <coughs> on specimen close to physiological conditions, we want to have it um, vitrified. So we want to have uh, all these uh, macromolecular complexes that are found in the test tube. We want to have it in a non-crystal uh, way. That's the advantage of electron microscopy. <coughs> and for that purpose, we need to uh, freeze it. So to vitrify it. Vitrify means that we are freezing, but water molecules cannot make ice crystal. So the freezing must be extremely fast. So here is an EM grid. It's three, uh, then an, an inch actually in diameter. And we put some sample, it can be three mic microliters or five microliters of our solution. And then we freeze it. So this is uh, one of the commercial, uh, commercial freezing devices, actually. I, I still prefer the manual one, but uh, it's, uh, the trick here is that it uh, keeps the temperature and the humidity condition. And by the way, the first prototype of, of, of such a machine was developed in the Technion by Ishi Talmon. For the, again, yet for another uh, reason, not for biology at all, but in uh, surfactant chemistry, it's very important that the uh, lipids would sit on the grid for at least an hour before, before they are frozen to uh, equi equilibrate. And that's, of course, if you have three, five microliters, it will evaporate. So they uh, really uh, develop a chamber that allows you to keep a drop and freeze it automatically afterwards. And so this device is based on that. The idea is that we put here our sample. You see it here, and we have uh, filter papers that uh, simple, simply uh, touch the, the, the drop and then soak, the, uh, um, uh, soak most of the liquid. Uh, and then we plunge into liquid ethane. The reason why we need liquid, so the liquid ethane is cooled by liquid nitrogen. We cannot use uh, liquid nitrogen because of the leiden frost effect. You know, if you put your hand in liquid nitrogen in the first few uh, fraction of a second, nothing happened because of the formation of, of gas that protect your hand. But if you do it in liquid ethane, I think you'll be in trouble, so don't try. So. But uh, then you uh, freeze it, and you end up with a very thin film that is full of the uh, macromolecular complexes, in this case, in all possible direction. This would work if your sample is thinner than uh, about 15 micrometers. Okay? If your sam sample is much thicker, and we'll discuss it why we need thicker sample later on, then um, you need to use what we call high pressure freezer. High pressure freezing means that while you are freezing your sample, uh, there is a 2,000 bar uh, a nitrogen <coughs> jet that pushes the sample, and by that, does not allow the water to crystallize and to expand in volume. Okay, so you can freeze larger, but you, and and then the and then the limit would be around 200 micrometers. So you still also with this high pressure freezing, you cannot freeze things which are larger than uh, 200 micrometers. So in single particle EM, as I said, the idea is that we collect different projections and we classify them <coughs> to groups, to classes. Here, for example, you can see, so this is an image, and the trick here is simply to uh, to add all the orientation of a complex. So this is a real realistic 
a high resolution cryo image. Okay, you hardly see anything, but uh, actually it's quite good if you add the right component together. Of course, the signal to noise increase uh, dramatically, and you see it start to see things. Uh, and and uh, each of the class compose of many of these complexes, and then they are merged using back projection. For that. So now uh, we look to so this is the back projection, and now let's le go a bit to, to the practice. So really how it works, we have a, a sample, in this case it's viruses. This is actually herpes viruses, this uh, animation. We plunge freeze them, and then under liquid nitrogen, so uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, we bring it into the, introduce it into the electrons, and we tilt our sample. When we tilt our sample, we end up with a projection, projection images, <coughs> a set of projection images, and then we uh, back project these images into a, a volume to obtain a 3D structure or 3D density map that is similar to the original map. It's still quite noisy, but it, we can see a lot. And then, of course, we can scroll through the volumes. And we have the advantage here is that we really have three-dimensional information on every feature that you see. So we can really uh, also color it. Although we pay millions for electron microscope, the electrons are still not colored. And that's a big <laughs> problem. We don't, we don't pay millions. Yeah, I, I don't know about you. I pay many millions. So, <laughs> so um, uh, <coughs> more than ten years, we have shown that actually these techniques can be done, can be used for uh, cells, where we grow at that time dictyostelium cells. Uh, directly on an EM grid, and you see the dictyostelium qu are quite happy on the grid. They even uh, divide on the EM grid. Well, at least we cannot hear them complaining, which is already good. <laughs> and, <coughs> and then we freeze such a sample, take it to the electron uh, microscope, and a typical projection. I have to say that if you are extremely uh, lucky, you'll get this uh, projection. Um, and uh, what you see in this projection, you see mainly the boundary of the, uh, of the cell. You definitely cannot identify anything in the interior of the cell. <laughs> what you only see, like the boundary of the cell, is the cell membrane, because the cell membrane is continuous along the thickness of the sample. And, and therefore, in a projection, it's a very strongly pronounced. But when you do the reconstruction, and here is a section through the reconstruction you start to see all kind of features the actin cytoskeleton so the in this particular uh, sample it's clearly that these are actin uh, as we took here system that do, do not do, that does not have any intermediate filament so that's uh, that was uh, a very very uh, good idea to do and then um, and uh, all the macromolecular complexes. So in fact, one can say that these are three-dimensional representation of the, of the macromolecular complexes situated in this particular region. And you can learn, let's say, in the lowest resolution, you can learn how the macromolecular are organized here. Or you can look on the cytoskeleton. And uh, because it's still a uh, quite thick sample, uh, this one was, I think, about 300 uh, nanometer, you can still see the actin and the uh, branching and interactions between uh, complexes. Now, with time, it turned out that you can do it on most cells. So this, now we are looking on tomogram oil <coughs> from uh, fibroblast, mouse embryonic fibroblast, and this tomogram in uh, comparison to the previous one, it's much more noisy because we did not do any kind of denoising. But still, you can see already a lot of features. It looks like uh, very much uh, less uh, in, uh, in quality, but actually it's uh, the same. You can see microtubules and so on. In fact, this, uh, this tomogram is in such a, a, a 
good signal to noise and we can deduce from such a tomogram a lot and nowadays we can do everything in a, a yes What do you mean? What do you mean optical axis here? Yeah. Yes. Yes, but we are. You, so all the idea is, is that we are decide before we start the experiment. We decide what to look at, and we make sure that it's in the right position. Look, the only, the only, the only um, requirement here is uh, to be, to see the features. You don't need to be on any axis. You do, but it doesn't matter so much at this stage. So you do need to be in the axis, but the axis on the, of the tilt, not the optical axis. The sure, but you are aligned for that, that's clear. But uh, the optical axis in electron microscopy stays and you cannot touch it. You just align to that. Okay, so in this uh, example, I want to show you that we, in a such a great uh, situation nowadays, that we can fully automatic. Uh, this should have been a movie. That very automatic, we detect this uh, actin filament, we quantify them completely, and we can nowadays see every interactions between the actin. Uh, uh, directionality or uh, structure of the of the uh, of the cross linkers fully automatic. In fact, with the new detectors, not only that. That here you can see, for example, uh, the stress fibers, and you can see the microtubules. Each of the actin filaments look more or less like here. It's still noisy, but we can follow the helical symmetry of the actin. Okay, so that means that in each of the filaments that you currently see, we are able to identify its polarity. And this is thanks to the direct detector that I will uh, mention in some minutes. You can see nowadays, if we see a microtubules, we actually see its protofilament inside the uh, cell. We are less interested in microtubules, but uh, still you can also uh, deduce the structure inside the cell. Okay, <coughs> and this uh, brings us to uh, maybe m one of the, or the only example, or most, uh, mainly the only example I discussed today, and it has to do with the, um, <coughs> with the uh, adhesion machinery, and not I wa only want to tell you a bit of the biology, but actually to show you through this example the problems, the advantage, and what we can, how can we uh, solve things and what can we do? <coughs> so one word on the adhesion machinery. So when, we are, when I'm saying adhesion machinery, I mainly refer to integrin mediated cell adhesion. So in the interactions of cell with the extracellular matrix, which is very important for uh, many uh, con consideration. I mean, uh, for example, uh, tissue uh, formation and all other things. Now, this, uh, uh, the interaction of the cell with the extracellular matrix occur in this region, this very elongated regions here, a uh, few micrometers in diameter, uh, uh, in which uh, the actin network shown in green interact with the membrane domain through a really very large macromolecular assembly terms, the cytoplasmic plaque of the adhesion machinery. For many years, it was uh, studied by mean of fluorescence microscopy, and, uh, and uh, uh, we were uh, interested to start to see its structure, to start to see its molecular organization. And then came the first <coughs> problem. If you take such a cell, vitrified, so the cell is, let's say, 30 micrometer, you vitrify it and put it under the electron beam, what you see is a huge gray region. You cannot identify any feature, any, any sh surely not a, a process like this one, and you definitely cannot even, you cannot really uh, 
differentiate between uh, the front and the rear of a cell. Okay, so how can we know where are we? And this is very critical because we are capable, those of you that remember yesterday, we are capable only to look, let's say, on a one micron on one micron. Okay, so this is less than 1% of the perimeter of the cell. Of course, we have a another, another major limitation, and this is the thickness of our sample. We cannot look on samples which are larger or thicker than one micrometer. Okay, because the electrons, the free mean pass of an electron in ice is something, uh, if we have a good microscope of 300 kilovolt, it will be around 300 uh, nanometer. We can, by means of removing the inelastic cutter, we can go, let's say, to <coughs> 500 nanometer. But 500 nanometer, when you tilt to 60 degrees, it's already one micron. And then you means that it means that you, now more than 90% of the electron that you shoot on the sample will not make it to the detector. Okay, so we really very much uh, limited to thin sample. If your sample is larger than uh, three, four hundred nanometer, the resolution will exponentially decrease. Okay, so um, we need a thin sample. That's, I guess, you understood from this. And also we need to know where we are. So in order to be sure we are looking on the right uh, position, and one of the problems in this field is that whenever you take a cell and look into the cell, you see very beautiful structures, always. But the problem is that you don't know what you are looking at and how physiological relevant this position is. So what can we do? We can do what is nowadays called correlative microscopy. The idea is the following. We have in this case cells that express uh, YFP paxilin. Paxilin is one of the hallmark molecules of the adhesion machinery. And um, we uh, scan under the fluorescence microscope the entire grid. So what we end up is a list of coordinates, essentially, where we have relevant cells and when and where we have a relevant adhesion machine. We have this in our hands, then we go to uh, our friend cell biologist, in this case to Benny Geiger, and we ask him, show him, show me a kosher uh, uh, adhesion site. It's always good to speak in Hebrew because I can use the word kosher <laughs> yeah, to, to, to speak in Israel, so I can use the word kosher. So, and here, for example, the three good ones, and then you can see the low uh, magnification of this one. And what we can reconstruct is only this small region. By the way, the, this region here we used for focusing, so we burn it on purpose in order to have a, a very defined focus regions. So you can see this, this is what we can get. So now you can understand that this is the cell, and now you can understand why it's extreme. No, this is an adhesion site, this is exactly this one. I'll show you also afterwards, let me put. But this is sim a simple adhesion site. Okay, so we need, actually it's a fraction of the adhesion site because the adhesion site is uh, typically two micrometer, so this is even, uh, this is only the very small, uh, the ver uh, let's say half of the adhesion site, and this is uh, more the uh, proximal part of the adhesion site. <coughs> okay, now we reconstruct it, and we see, of course, all the elements of the adhesion, maybe the actin cytoskeleton, some vesicles, and macromolecular complexes, and to make this long sto so story short, what we show here is about 500 actin filaments that organize in one of the idea, one of the things we've seen. Uh, we've seen a collection of, of uh, macromolecular complexes that are sitting in between the membrane and the actin cytoskeleton. Based on that, we suggested the following uh, model. And the nice thing about this model is that we took the very same system that was used by cell biologists, namely intact cells, and we worked on the very same system but got much higher resolution and much more information, and based on that we suggested a laminated view of how the adhesion is working. You see in the bottom we have, of course, the membrane, and then a 
an array, not organized, not ordered array, but an array of, or layer, I would say, of macromolecular complexes. And now if we go higher into cell, we start to see filamentous structure. And then the typical way of the stress fiber ends in the adhesion. I'm saying here a filamentous structure, and now here comes another problem. At the resolution of individual tomogram, you can you you don't necessarily you cannot necessarily identify for sure um, uh, short filament what are they because we do not stain we do not label the cell is intact which means also that we see everything that's the major advantage of fluorescence microscopy you label like we saw yesterday you label kelatrin you see kelatrin you don't see all the things around it which, of course, to some extent, it's great. To other extent, you don't, it simplifies the system, but you don't know what's all there. If you don't stand here, the idea is that we see everything, and the problem is that we not necessarily can identify what, uh, what <coughs> we see. And until you really can identify something, it's not so easy. Acting is relatively easy, because even in low resolution, because even before we saw all the helical symmetry, Simply because it has a very defined, uh, a very defined uh, diameter, and we know that it's long cables, and we know a lot about actin. But in many other cases, we do not know. Okay, <coughs> to look on adhesion. Yes. What are those green balls? These are not balls. These are, of course, macromolecular complexes. <laughs> what are those green macromolecules? Oh. So these are, first of all, we know by now that they, they have a molecular weight of around uh, 2 mega. Uh, we know that, for example, vinculin, another, uh, another, another uh, component of the adhesion machinery, is integral part of that. We did gold labeling. In Benny's, uh, in Benny's uh, uh, lab, the Weizmann, they purify a complex uh, more or less at that size that has two up to three uh, complexes with vinculin and we uh, think that it might be uh, these complexes but we still did not manage to have it pure enough to uh, have uh, a good EM uh, images on that. The reason also that they did it with uh, used a very very fundamental biochemical purification from chicken gizzards. So it's, uh, Does uh, membrane this I cannot say. So I cannot they say. Um, but they all seem to be aligned. And sure, that's line. that's true. They are, but uh, they are aligned. Also, let's put it this way: those that are not aligned or they are tilted too much, it's very hard for me to identify. No, but they were all. Just, they were just in a single layer. Right? I know because so they they, they were found. They were found in the lower seventy degree. 70 nanometer of the cell and only then they act in there actually one of the biological uh, uh, conclusion of this model is that actin never see the integral there is a buffered layer and after we publish it uh, there was a publication from claire watersman lab in in uh, nih that using uh, was it uh, palm it was 3d palm and they showed there that between the integrin and the actin, there is a layer, uh, they call it a regulating uh, layer or something, and exactly the same thing. Of course, they saw the molecules they uh, labeled, and uh, we could uh, actually conclude it from our maps. So, yeah. Those that, I cannot say that, uh, I don't know if there are also these uh, donut-shaped particles, uh, perpendicular to the orientation that we saw because I don't, it's very hard to identify. <coughs> okay, but we are now repeating these experiments in light of the new detectors and we, because even if we don't see better view of these uh, complexes, to know in the adhesion machinery the, uh, the helicity or the polarity of each actin filament is already should be very interesting. Okay, so uh, we continue in the adhesion system with looking on platelets because platelets are a fantastic sample for electron microscopy. They are extremely small, they are unnucleated. 
you know, they are uh, running in our vein in an un inactive form and whenever we have a wound, they would immediately close the wound so the integrin machinery will be activated and uh, the, in, uh, the platelets will adhere to the surface and, uh, and uh, uh, flatten. So here you can see a platelet, one of the only cells we can really um, collect information wherever we want because it's really thin. You can see mitochondria, for example, <laughs> here. And <coughs> here you can see such a, for example, a structure. So in this sample, we have really a lot of actin network. There was, there were, uh, automatically uh, segmented, and you can see the integrins on the surface. <coughs> One of the things we have seen when we look on the uh, platelets is, you can see it even here, is that Somehow the microtubules are always above the uh, actin cytoskeleton. They are not really integrated into the structure. There is a kind of a segregation. And I mentioned that especially I put this because of the, we heard yesterday that there are, uh, Tom mentioned uh, philopodia. So there are also philopodia. We worked in philopodia in the past with dictostelium and we published uh, uh, their uh, organization at several states and uh, apparently also in platelets in the first stage of platelet activation you have this uh, uh, structure but uh, surprisingly in a uh, in, uh, philopodia from platelets you very often see microtubules and the microtubules yet again it's segregated from the actin network it's always above Although this is only 60 nanometer, so it's really amazing that within 60 nanometer, a 20 nanometer structure can be really uh, direct very accurately. This is just to show that it's not the, uh, if you... Uh, is it directed or it dictates the direction? So, um, of course, I cannot answer this question, but only say that if we inhibit microtubule assembly, this is done so recently, you can still see <coughs> from time to time this uh, uh, philopodia. So it's probably, uh, it's somehow there, it, yeah, it, it's not, uh, maybe it's not essential, but it contributes to that system. So if we look now on comparing the fibroblasts and platelets adhesion, and uh, now not from biological side, but actually from uh, technical side. Uh, we have two major problems. One is, of course, the resolution. The resolution of this, uh, of, this, uh <coughs> of this structure is still quite limited, and we need to increase <coughs> the resolution. And there is another problem. You do not see the membrane on top of on bottom. That's simply because of the missing wedge effect. The reason is that we, as I mentioned before, we cannot collect all data. Okay, so uh, the missing wedge, uh, in real space, meaning that you do not see, if you have a vesicle, you do not see the top and the bottom of the vesicle. But we know that we actually have not much uh, to do against that, so we just know that and uh, we should be aware of that. So, what can we do in order to see the interaction of the cell with the surface? One uh, easy experiment was simply to put the platelets on collagen. Collagen is a paracrystalline structure and very easily can be seen and what you can see here is that the cell tries to maximize its interface with the uh, collagen and by that uh, kind of hug the collagen in order to have more adhesion sites and if we now turn all this structure upside down and look from the bottom you start to see the integrin okay so we can see in the if we do the right experiment we can see the interactions of the cell with the extracellular matrix. But of course the resolution is far from what we want. We want to get really much higher in resolution and for that uh, uh, I would like to introduce the new cameras that we have and first of all let's look on the old camera. This is a conventional CCD. So what you see here is a, a junction between two platelets. Okay. Now if we uh, if we reconstruct this region, this small region here in a full resolution, you can see the, this was done in this region. 
In between the cells there should be nothing, and therefore the density should be much lighter. Because the very low signal-to-noise ratio from this camera, what we see is that we can hardly differentiate between this region and, and this region. So it's really very noisy. Those of you that can look on tune rings will see that uh, the information really uh, declined very fast. So the direct detector, <coughs> direct detectors that we have nowadays are much better. First of all, they can they collect image every uh, five ten milliseconds, which means that we can uh, use it in what we call a video mode or a movie mode. Which means that if we have one second exposure, we end up with a hundred projections. Okay, and then we can see. Uh, let's say, if there were movements of the macromolecular complex. That's very important because after we have this device, we realize that in all of our pictures, we had movement that we could not detect, and that also reduced the sharpness, resolution of our image. But beside that, these detectors, we can s you can see it here, you have information essentially until what we call Nyquist frequency, so the highest possible resolution which is two pixels. So, but you can see, if we look now on the uh, region in between the cell, you can really see the, uh, the um, you can really see the, uh, the difference between out of the cells and in of the cells. Of course, these are uh, two different cells. You cannot, in the moment that you expose your sample, you cannot now change the camera, let's say, and do the experiment again on the very same simple, the sample, but it's actually very similar. It's actually thicker than the previous tomogram I've shown you. Now, if we compare the two, you can see that in the, uh, with the new detector, we can really see the two leaflets of a membrane in individual, in individual uh, uh, tomogram, which means that in all of our cellular tomograms, we see two leaflets of the membrane, and therefore we can see much more things that transverse the membrane, receptors, integrins, everything. So this is, uh, has to do with uh, hardware, and this is now integrated in most uh, of the labs, I think, because it's a major breakthrough. But you can also, of course, if you want to get higher resolution, you can work harder and get a better sample. And, yes? So just, just a technical question. So, <coughs> so the electron, the, your electron dose is still the same? It's uh, actually smaller. So, so the trick was that the cameras are more sensitive? Yeah. Yes, you, you need much less electron, also because you ca there's no much blurring here effect, blurring effect. So, yeah, so and therefore you can use much less electrons in order to see the feature. You know, one of the things we need here in tomography is to see the fiducial markers that we put in, in order to align the projections. Now, when you go to high tilt, it's not always so easy. But here you can use much less dosage to feed it, and that's very important. And we know now, because we have these things, that the, the devices, that if you reduce the, the dosage, let's say, from 100 electrons per angstrom to 40, you can really push the resolution much, much more. And are you, <coughs> when you get, let's say, a projected view, are you taking several images on that same orientation, or you're, so you're averaging, or you're simply collecting through the same number of projections just faster. And the less no. Those. So both. We, 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 we take less images. If we, so it depends what you want to do. Okay, if you want so to do... Like the example you just showed. So if you want to do... If you, do, if you want to do cellular visualizing, visualizing cellular parts, not averaging afterwards. You can do averaging afterwards. Because if you do averaging afterwards, I would say, you reduce dramatically the dosage, you reduce dramatically the number of uh, projection, really dramatically, and then you take uh, and then you take uh, the features you like to average and average. If you want to, if you cannot average because you look on cellular parts, then of course you want to have a certain dosage uh, that will give you a signal to know. And typically it will be 40 to 45 electron per angstrom. So we use anyhow much less dose. We are much closer to focus. 
and uh, because we have such a nice contrast pair projection, we can also, also apply CTF correction. I will not go into too much details, but I'm sure you know what I mean. And then, and therefore, we are even not restricted to the first zero, the first uh, uh, zero <coughs> of, of the uh, that restrict our resolution. Okay. So what I just want to show you here is that here apparently it's done. I went once to uh, to. Uh, um, to Adassa and heard a talk of a medical doctor uh, named uh, David Varon, and he showed that apparently platelets uh, cut into pieces in our veins. This is a physiological relevant uh, procedure, and they cut into very small pieces, very small fraction. This fraction essentially knows how to adhere to surfaces. Okay? And what happened is that uh, it's excellent for electron tomography, and you can see, okay, it's excellent for electron tomography, and you can see that when we scroll through, we see uh, fantastically the actin, we see the integrin, and I just <coughs> will skip most of what I still want to show, but uh, maybe to show you that you see here the integrin, and uh, when we uh, took, when we took this, uh, uh, uh Platelets derive particles from patients who have a uh, Glanzmann thrombostenia. This is a really severe disease where uh, people are really uh, bleeding. And when we took this and put and reconstruct the structure of these uh, features from these patients, we realized that, of course, they have almost no integrins on their surface. So the in this case, this is what we call Glanzmann type 1 there's only 20% 20 20 of the integrin left, and this is actually a different type of integrin that's left. So the alpha 2b beta 3, the most common integrin is here, and when you remove it, when you, uh, in these platelets uh, that do not, uh, from these patients, you don't see. Okay, I would like actually to, okay, we can see the, we can see individual integrins, so therefore we can get the structure, and I will skip that because I just want to show you additional, I would say, uh, development that we did. And that has to do with, we okay, now we looked on structural biology of cells, which are very important because it's med structure and cell biology. And then what about tissues? What about multicellular organism? And can we deal with this? And the answer is that uh, you can. And the way we decided to do it is the following. So it was shown recently that if you have a frozen sample, you can mill regions that you don't want with uh, what we call cryofib. So your sample is vitrified, and then you uh, cut whatever you want. You end up with a very thin slice. Okay? This was shown uh, on individual cells. And now we uh, wanted to do it on an uh, organism like C. elegans. But if we want to freeze C. elegans, we have to do it in high-pressure freezing. And when we do high-pressure freezing, typically what we get is such a thing. You see the warm air, the uh, environment here is dextrin. You typically use dextrin. And that's a problem because you, uh, don't have, you cannot know where, where, will you, uh, where will you meal, which exactly position you want to meal. What we want to have is such a thing. So here you see a vitrified warm, Okay, with vitrified warm, which has no any material in its environment. How did we do that? And what we did here, just before the freezing, we put the warm into um, methyl pentane and freeze it immediately. The advantage of methyl pentane, if you go to ma minus 150, the sample is still vitrified, and do it in vacuum, methyl pentane will, pentane will sublimate and you end up with such a thing okay now now I want let's say this cell so I cut these cells and I end up with a beautiful slice that allow me now to get the structure now this solve another problem <coughs> and this is my last slide so um, you can freeze a worm and mill it and then you have a slice but now you want to have fiducial markers on your sample so starting my career by uh, gold cluster chemistry, we simply synthesize monolayer protected gold nanoparticles 
uh, are protected with uh, uh, alki uh, thioalkyls. And they are, of course, very nicely solubilized in methylpentane. So if you have such a, a section, you can now dip your section in uh, gold, which solubilizes with methylpentane in under 150 degrees. And then, uh, again, you go to the vacuum. Your sample is still uh, vitrified, but you have gold markers here. So and then you can uh, collect the data in any magnification or under focus condition that you want. Okay, by that I'll finish, but maybe one uh, step for the future. So what can, again, what can still be developed? We know that nowadays we have this fantastic camera that's a major uh, game changer. There are additional things uh, in the pipeline. For example, there is faceplate. I guess uh, it, will, uh, it will contribute mainly to, uh, to the possibility to look on small structures that we would not be able to identify. And maybe the more, uh, maybe still fantasy, is the work that I uh, recently saw from the Alevi Satos lab. This has nothing to do with biology, but uh, maybe with this uh, very fast <laughs> Uh, refreshing, um, very fast uh, readout of our new uh, cameras, it can also apply to uh, biology. And the experiment they did here, they took uh, 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 two nanometer platinum uh, nanocrystals, uh, 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 nanoparticles, put it in between uh, two layers of graphene. So this is water, essentially, room temperature. And now this you can put into the electron microscope because this uh, water is not going to be evaporated into the electron microscope. Because we have this very fast readout. Now, if you take an image, because of thermal motion, these uh, particles will rotate. As a result, you have all possible direction, projection from all possible direction, and you can really get in this case, they get an angstrom, a few angstrom uh, resolution um, uh, of individual complexes. And maybe one can nowadays do it, at least partially can do it in biology, uh, and uh, really get structure, high resolution structure of individual macromolecular complexes. I think that one of the co-authors in, uh, in this work was a previous member of your lab. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, this is, I think, uh, really fantastic. Of course, it's not in biology yet, but at least it a, a might come, and this is a fantastic uh, article I really recommend to read. Okay, by that I'll finish, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> so any questions for oh, Had? How is the coming done on the tomographs? How do you find the axis? Uh, you so need to line by So line. segmentation you mean. So on actin uh, an actin I think I show one of the movies you can do now there's fully automatic and segmentation. But actin is a unique system because it's has a very defined, uh, a very defined uh, uh, diameter and properties. Um, microtubules you can also do segmentation, but uh, in many other cases you can also do segmentation of the globular complexes or fully automatic. But you know the segmentation is, for example. You know, look, the segmentation is only to show the audience and to impress. I mean, uh, no one really do any calculation with the segmented structure. When we need to measure something, we never go to the segmenta segmented volume because this is extremely subjective. Okay, you do everything on the original gray value uh, uh, volume. More questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>